Um, so we've been talking about instrumental variables estimation. And instrumental variables estimation is a solution to what problem? It's when your right-hand side variables are correlated with the error term. And we know that causes both bias and inconsistency. We've mostly been looking at consistency lately. But we know correlation of the X with the U causes these problems. And that instrumental variables is the solution. Um, and so what is a good instrument? So that was one of the homework questions good instrument is correlated with the thing you're instrumenting for, the thing that's correlated with the error, the x you're instrumenting for, it's got to be correlated with that x. So if z is your instrument, z is correlated with x, and z is uncorrelated with the error term, and it's not one of the x's. And so if you have a model that's yt is beta 1, plus beta 2, x 2 t, plus u t, or I guess I'm using t's instead of i's, oh well. It's just the number of observations. When these are correlated, you have a problem. And the solution is to find a z t, an instrumental variable, for x 2 t. And again, that z is correlated with x. So it serves sort of as a proxy for x. If you th Intuitively, that's really all that's going on. It proxies for x. But it's uncorrelated with the error. So when you let it serve as sort of as a proxy, um, it doesn't cause problems with correlation with the error term. And then it, it can't be one of the other x's or x itself. OK, so what I want to start doing today is show you how to do this on the computer. It's really easy. And then we'll move on to chapter 9. Chapter 9 involves exactly the same kind of estimation. So although in the first part of the course the heteroscedasticity estimation of that sort of thing is rather involved, here it's rather easy and it's more conceptually difficult. You have to sort of conceptually figure out what to do. And once you know what to do, once you read the cookbook right, then you just do what it says to do. It's real simple to do on the computer. So we'll show you how to do instrumental variables estimation today. And then we'll continue with that for a while into chapter 9. Chapter 9 does simultaneous equations. And you, you get exactly the same problem, correlation of the x with the error. And so the same solution is going to be available to us for that reason. OK, so let me pull up our friend you use. Where the hell is it? Heck is it? I guess I need to do a new workbook thing, right? A work file, whatever. This is an undated file. Goes from 1 to 540. This is the books data set that I'm using. So it's one with earnings and all sorts of things. Also experience and um, other variables. Schooling. In fact, let me show you the data set I'm going to use here. I need the, I need the variable names anyway. So it's this EAEF that's described in the text. I need these variable names when I read it in, so I'm just going to grab them. <coughs> so let's open that file. like the number of siblings. Most people just have one. Hmm. Nobody has more than... Oh, that's just a dummy variable for siblings or not. <coughs> this is whether your parent had a library card, things like this. Experience, work experience. This is your earnings. Schooling of the father, schooling of the mother. And what is S? Your individual schooling, yeah, that's right. So we're going to run the regression um, for 
log of earnings on a constant on schooling and experience. And then for reasons we don't have to worry about for this, I just want to show you how to do it. We're going to worry that this schooling variable is correlated with the error. So we're going to instrument for schooling. And we'll use a couple of different kinds of instruments. So we'll first run the base regression. Make sure this is tables. I'm going to do exactly what's in tables 10.2 and 10.3 in the text. So I'm duplicating perfectly, I hope, what's in those two tables. So this is an example straight from the book. And so we'll first run this regression, then we'll use an IV for this, and we'll use two types of instrumental variables. First we'll use SM as an instrument for S. So this is a schooling of the mother. We assume it's correlated with your own schooling, it tends to be true. And for arguments I don't want to get into, you can make an argument, it doesn't have the same correlation with the error term. So that's one thing we'll do. The other thing we want to note is you, you can instrument with more than one variable. So we're going to instrument with a whole set of variables. SM, SF, <coughs> siblings, and library. So we'll run both of those two regressions. So we have three regressions to run. The one where we don't use instrumental variables is base regression. That's the first part of table 10.2. Then we'll run the instrumentals with the SM as an instrument. That's the second part of table 10.2. Then we'll run the um, multiple instruments model. Because this is what we'll end up doing in chapter 9 is these kind of, this kind of instrumenting. I'll say a lot more about why we do it this way when we get there. I'm just kind of showing you right now how to do the instrumental variables estimation. We haven't talked a lot about doing this part yet, but since I'm here, I just want to show you how to do it. Okay, um, let me pull one more thing up here. I went ahead and loaded tables 8.2 and 8.3, so I just copied these right out of the book just to make sure we get the same answers. Let's hope we do. <laughs> I did it two or three times at home and managed to. So the first thing I need to do is the log of earnings. So let's generate um, log earn equals log of earnings. Does that look right? I think so. Then we'll just run the first regression, which is the log of earnings on a constant S and experience. <coughs> then we'll hope we get the same answers on that table. Or I did something wrong. Okay, so, hmm. I know what I did. I have to start over. This one doesn't have any data in it, in fact, probably. <laughs> yeah, that's, I think I know what I did. Let me start over. Sorry. I'll show you in a sec. The data set starts at A2. I said it started at B2. And so it pulled the wrong observations. So uh, something to watch out for. <laughs> Sorry. This is your nightmare. <laughs> Right here, I should have said A2, because this data set starts at A2. And now people have a lot more siblings. Now I'm wondering if anyone has 10. Is that right? Earnings. Well, let's try it. So let's generate. <coughs> log earn
We're going to work. <coughs> that looks better. Now the question is whether I got the same numbers. Those don't look right. is 50932. 50932. Okay, it's the same. Okay, so it's identical to what's in the table. I just couldn't read the table right. Had a moment of panic there. Okay? Alright, good. Okay, now let's run the instrumental variables regression. So you just do the same thing. You say quick estimate, and you put the same model in as before, log earn C S experience, then choose two stage least squares. It doesn't actually say instrumental variables. Two stage least squares is actually a special case of instrumental variables. We haven't quite. So choose that. You see here where it says instrument list? You need to put everything so it'll be the constant. <laughs> then I put the thing I'm instrumenting for. Instead of S, I put SM. And then you put EX experience just like before. You're essentially telling it what the exogenous variables are, but we'll get to that. See that? So you just replace this with this. Next time I'll replace this with this whole set. Next time it'll just be C, that whole set of four things, and then experience. So here's our new instrumental variables regression. 039442 is the coefficient on experience. 039442 is right there. So we got the same answers as in the book. Yay. Now that I can read the tables right, it's working better. And so that's all there is to it. That's instrumental variables regression. That's how hard it is. The hard part's picking an instrument that's valid. And that's what we'll have to spend more time on. So conceptually, it might be harder to defend your instrument. But once you have your instrumental variables, that's all there is to it. For the other one, for the second set there, you just do the same thing. You say quick, estimate, base model, log earn, spell it right, um, C, S, experience, two stage least squares, then just put in your instrument list. Your instrument are all the things that aren't correlated with the error. Constant. In this case, I want the four variables, um, SM, SF, um, what are siblings and library. And then put in the experience variable. It's best to use different names. It's best to spell things right. <coughs> Works a lot better. So we just put these four things in that slot, and you're done. You spelled it right and all that. 039761. 039761. We got the same answers in the book. Yay. So that's it. That's instrumental variables estimation.
So in this model, instead of saying beta hat 2 OLS was the sum of the xi minus x bar, yi minus y bar. over the sum of the xi minus x bar squared. What you're now estimating with instrumental variables is the sum of the zi minus z bar times yi minus y bar over the sum of the xi minus x bar times zi minus z bar. So it's not quite like using z as a proxy. If you, were, if you were literally just putting z in place of x and using OLS, you'd get this estimator, but these would both be z's. You're still retaining the information in x to some extent in your estimator. You're not throwing it out altogether. So it's, a, it's different than just putting z in like a proxy for x and estimating that. We know that causes problems when you use errors and variables. But, but when you use this estimator, it solves the problem. And we showed that last time why. So we're estimating this. Now, when there's more than two variables, it's a little harder. The one we just estimated, the formula is a bit different. You have to use matrix algebra. For the one before that, this is exactly the estimate that was used. This is S. This is the log of experience. This is S. And this is SM. So this was SM. This was the log of experience here. And this variable here was still S. This is the log of earnings. Hmm? The log of earnings. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, thanks. And I didn't look to see. You can look at the tables. I can't remember if these change a lot or not. Yeah, it makes a difference. The coefficient on S goes from 1, 2, 3 to 1, 5, 9. Experience from 3, 5 to 3, 9. So it changes the estimates. It really changes the standard errors in some cases. Look at the standard error on S went way up. So did the standard error on the constant changed a lot. So it makes a difference in your estimation to do this. All right. So chapter nine is next. Chapter 9 is simultaneous equation models. You want to try to connect what we've been doing to economic theory a little more closely than we have so far. So now we want to start writing down what we call structural models. And those can have many equations in them. We'll have lots of examples of what we mean by that. Y equals C plus I plus G. I equals C equals. You can have an IS, an LM equation, you can have a whole system of equations. How do we estimate that system of equations is really the question that we're trying to address here. Supply and demand equations give you a system. So we'll talk a lot about that as well. Um, so let me talk a little bit about uh, the terminology that goes with structural and reduced form models and other sorts of things. So this is just just terminology, first of all. So generally what we'll start with are what we call the structural equations. And these come in different flavors, and we'll, we'll talk about all the different types of structural equations as we go through. So, so we start with structural equations. From structural equations, we go to reduced form equations. These have the endogenous 
as a function of just the exogenous variables. And we'll talk about what that means in a bit. So under, with a reduced form, you've solved the model in a way so that all of your endogenous variables are on the left-hand side. All the models that are determined within the system. These are the things determined outside your set of equations, outside of your system. With structural equations, you can have endogenous variables, there's more than one of these, to be a function of both the endogenous and the exogenous variables. And so a basic system will always be, you have consumption as a function of income, and income is determined within the system. So consumption's endogenous, income's endogenous, then you might have government spending or, or federal funds rate or something that's determined outside the model by policy authorities or something like that. But, but those basic equations are, are some endogenous variable like consumption is a function of some endogenous variable like income or interest rates. Investment might be a function of interest rates, but interest rates are determined within the model. So they're endogenous, they're not exogenous. Whenever you have endogenous variables on the right-hand side, you induce the kinds of correlations we've been talking about, and that's something we'll show. You get correlation with these endogenous variables and the error term. Not in every case. There's some special cases where that's not true, where we have what's called a recursive structure. But for the most part, this will cause problems. What we need to do then, these, this, is, this is what we're interested in. This is where you'd estimate the MPC or the interest elasticity of investment or things like that. So these are the things we're interested in. These are what we want to know. We can't estimate those directly because of this problem. So what we do is we estimate the reduced forms. We transform the model in some way so that we don't have endogenous variables on the right-hand side anymore, and then we estimate this. Then what you have to do is worry about, can I go from here back to here? And that's something called identification. So we'll have to worry about whether our models are identified, whether we can estimate these reduced forms and then recover the structural equations. It'll take us a long time to get through all of this. But basically, that's what we want to learn about. And then we'll have an estimation technique that we can estimate this directly that sort of does all this in the background. And that's what that two-stage least squares you just saw is. So there's a first stage and a second stage, and sort of takes away. You replace these endogenous variables with their estimates, and the estimates don't have the problem. They, they serve as proxies. The first stage, you form the proxies. The second stage, you put them in here and run the regressions, and it solves the problem. And you can do that all with instrumental variables. So, so we'll talk about all of that. But, but basically, right now, we just I really want to get this structural reduced form distinction in your heads. That, that's the main thing for the moment. So let me just start with a simple supply and demand example. So here's some structural equations. Um, quantity demanded is alpha naught plus alpha 1 P plus alpha 2 times income. So this is just income for people who participate in this market plus U. So we're thinking this is just a standard old demand curve, so, you know, the demand for chalk or bicycles or whatever, just some demand. Alpha 1 is probably negative, alpha 2 is probably positive, unless it's some weird good, you know, like income goes up, consumption goes down, there are goods like that. We won't worry about that. QS is beta 0 plus beta 1 P plus beta 2 times R plus V, so that's supply. So these are our behavioral equations. This is the behavior of consumers. So these are called structural. The other name we give them is behavioral equations. This is the behavior of consumers. This is the behavior of firms. And we derive these from utility maximization and profit maximization. So they, they directly relate to the underlying behavioral assumptions. Now there's also this equation. So this is a three equation system. That's the equilibrium condition. You usually sub this in and work with two equations and call them both Q. And technically, you've got a three equation system here. So in this model here, we have two behavioral equations, supply and demand, and one 
equilibrium condition. So there's two types of structural equations already, behavioral equations and equilibrium conditions. Now, if you think about this model, it's just a standard old price quantity model. You've got a demand curve, a supply curve. The demand curve depends upon income. The supply curve, I think R is rainfall, whether it is or not. Let's call it rainfall. We can call it whatever we want. So let's call it rainfall. I think that's what it is. Yeah, it's rainfall. So let's call it R rainfall. Some question about that? So what exactly is the supply of rainfall? Some quantity, some good. It doesn't matter. You think of wheat, rice. Was that? Oh well, wheat, rice. <laughs> This is just something I made up, so it's not really just some quantity of some good that depends upon rain. It doesn't matter what it is. The point is that's an exogenous variable that's determined outside the system. These things, Q and P, so Q and P are the endogenous variables. And in this model, R and Y are the exogenous <coughs> So basically, you give the model R and Y, this is supply and demand, and it spits out P and Q. So R and Y are like the data that come in. They tell you where these curves are. Those are the exogenous variables that are outside the system. And inside the system, given this data, you determine P and Q. So these are, these are the exogenous things. The endogenous stuff is done inside the box, inside the model. The box is the model. And then it spits out P and Q. And if I give it a different Y or a different R, it spits out a different P and Q. So whatever data I give it, the model just spits out a new P and Q. Now, this model already, you can see this structure. Because this is endogenous, this is endogenous, this is endogenous, this is endogenous, and these are exogenous. So we have endogenous as a function of endogenous in both of these models. And that's going to be a problem. Now, let's just simplify this thing for, see, where am I here? I'm going to do this systematically. Um, okay, so let's just leave that one there. You can now, you can also reduce this system. You can just name this Q, name both of those Q. You can plug that in, QD equals QS equals Q to here. This is what you usually look at. Is something like that. Now I just have two equations in my system, and they're both behavioral, because I subbed this one in. This is no longer part of it. So the number of equations is, can be different depending on what you've subbed in or what I haven't subbed in. I can plug that into there and get a one equation system too. But this is the basic supply and demand. This is the basic behavioral model we, we want to work with right here. So that's two equations, once we sub that in, two endogenous variables. And among my exogenous variables here, when I write down this system, there's also a constant that's also exogenous. That's data that comes in. So the exogenous variable, there's really three exogenous variables, Y, R, and C. The endogenous are P and Q. So I didn't, I didn't no C over there. But that's another variable. It's not determined within the system. It's just a fixed variable at every point in time. All right. 
try another one. We're going to call the number of endogenous variables will be G, and the number of exogenous variables we'll call K. So we won't use that for a while, but just why I'm here. So in this model, G is 2 and K is 3. So this is K and this is G. G is almost always equal to the number of equations. Occasionally it's not, but for the most part it is. Let me write down another model and take a look at that. So that's more of a micro model. Let's do a macro kind of model. Look at that. <coughs> we haven't found the reduced forms yet. We'll get there. Here's a CT is alpha naught plus alpha 1 dyt. That's disposable income. So consumption is a function of disposable income. We have habit persistence. So your income yesterday matters too. If you were rich yesterday and poor today, your consumption is still higher than it would have been. So your consumption yesterday matters or your income yesterday, plus UT. So this is consumption. Let's have investment equal B0 plus B1YT, not disposable income, but just income, plus B2. Some investment takes a while to put in place, so income yesterday helps determine investment today. So this is your investment equation. Disposable income is YT minus taxes. So taxes are T of T. So this is consumption, investment. This is an identity. <coughs> it just defines disposable income, of course. This is how disposable income is defined. So that's a third type. This is a behavioral equation. <coughs> Talks about how people consume. This is a behavioral equation. This is an identity, which is yet another type of equation that can fit into these models. Now we often just sub this in. Then you can get rid of the identity. But, but identity is another part of the, of the model. And then yt is ct plus it plus gt. That's the equilibrium condition. So this model has three types of equations. It has behavioral equations, an identity, and an equilibrium condition. So this is just nothing more than y is c of y minus t plus i of r plus g. We're just defining these two functions explicitly. You've seen that. We're just trying to get a linear version of that model. Okay, this one has four structural equations. Some of them are behavioral, some of them are identities, some of them are equilibrium conditions. Just so you have it somewhere in your notes, let me write down. CT is consumption, D of YT is disposable income, IT is investment, T of T is taxes, and G of T is government.
looking the wrong way on the bar, right to left, is what you're supposed to do. Um, so how many endogenous variables in this model? I have to tell you, because it's not always clear what's endogenous and what's exogenous. It's not always the case that you can look at a model and make that determination. In this case, you can probably think about it, well, taxes are set by the government, government spending set by the government, those are probably exogenous variables. But basically, someone usually has to tell you what's exogenous and what's endogenous. So this has four structural equations, as we said. And it has four endogenous variables. Again, the endogenous variables are almost always equal to the number of equations. It's certainly equal to the number of unique equations. If they're not the same, you've got either a system that isn't identified or a redundancy. But, so that's generally going to be the same. In this model, there are YT, CT, disposable income, and investment. Often they're the things on the left, but they don't have to be. In our last model, price was endogenous, but it didn't appear on the left-hand side ever. So they don't have to appear on the left-hand side. It's convenient here because they do, but... We have two what we call predetermined variables. Those are dyt minus 1 and yt minus 1. We don't really want to call those exogenous because last period they were determined within the system. But this period they're essentially exogenous. They're not changing. They were set last period. It doesn't really matter who set them. So they're predetermined. They're not set this period. They're not part of a box. They're data that comes in. So these are part of the data that comes into the box that determines these four variables. So in this model, these are the things that come out of it. Two of the things that come into it are the data from the last period. And this is the model. And the model spits out the endogenous variables. We also have three exogenous variables. A constant, government spending, and um, taxes. So the other things that come in here are C, G, T, and um, taxes. So given the, this data, C's, you, know, you already you know that. But it's part of the data. It comes in, the model does its thing, and it spits these out. And you've, you've done this diagrammatically at least through ISLM and 45 degree line diagrams and all that sort of thing. And then you look at how output changes when government spending changes or taxes change. You can work out the multipliers with this and all that sort of stuff. <laughs> Generally, we'll just group these into one group and call these all predetermined. Books differ. I don't think your book's very strict about this distinction. Some are very strict about it. You can only call one kind of variables one thing. They're either all exogenous or all predetermined. They behave the same. So I'm not going to be too particular about the names I use. I'll try to use predetermined for the lag endogenous and exogenous for this. But sometimes I'll end up calling these exogenous. And sometimes I'll end up calling these predetermined because it all really means the same thing. In my head, those concepts aren't, aren't any different because there's no reason for them to be, and so I don't bother to keep them separate. But technically, that's the way it ought to be. Now, there's one more type of equation that I didn't do here that I need to talk about. So let's talk about it. Yeah. What can I see in the equation? Oh, um, it's these constants. Oh. So these are times 1, times 1. C is just the vector of 1s. 
it's just that um, call of ones that would be in your spreadsheet if the program didn't do it automatically. The program does it automatically, so you don't have to put it in your spreadsheet. But if the program didn't do it, you'd have a whole thing of ones. That's a piece of data that comes in. It's not, it never changes, so. This data is never going to change, so it's never going to affect the equilibrium in any meaningful way, unless you change one of these constants. Okay, there's one more type of equation where I write it. Right here is good enough. And these are technical equations, as they're called. So there's also technical equations. And the best example is a production function. That would be a, a technical equation. You might say, okay, the log of y is d0 plus d1 log k plus d2 log l or something like that. That would be a technical equation, as it's called. It's, it's how resources get transformed into output. So it's not really a behavioral equation in, the sen in that same sense as a behavioral equation. So we have behavioral equations, technical equations, equilibrium conditions, and identities. Four types. Hey, those are the four types are in my notes. Four types of equations. I can't really think of any other technical equations, so we call that a technical equation. Pretty much everything else is behavioral. So now let's talk about reduced form equations. So this has been all about the structural equations. Yes? So why is it technical? I mean, what's technical about it? Or? Um, it's the technical process of a factory in a way it... it so, so how is in, like, the, the, behavioral the behavioral equations, how are they different from the technical? That's an individual's preferences. This is determined like technical things like technology. Like a production function? Yeah, this, this is a production function. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> I meant to say that. Yeah, this is a production function. Yeah, I should have said that. Yeah. So are yeah. technical equations production functions? Yeah, I, just, yeah I, was, I was just saying, I was trying to think of another technical equation. I can't think of any others. Okay. There may be others out there somewhere. That's the only one I know about. We just don't want to call this behavioral equation because it's not really an individual behaving in some way. This is about the technical aspects of production and how much you can get out of a set of resources. So it, it, it's, it's the behavior of the factory in some sense, but it's not, it's not a person, if you know what I'm saying, in, in the same sense as the behavioral equation. And production functions are really the only one I can think of off the top of my head, or even the bottom of it. Yeah. I wanted to move this, my head said, oh, control A, control C, control V. It doesn't work that way in the chalkboard. <laughs> so yeah, production functions. Okay, uh, reduced form equations. What are those? If you look at the last model, you can see very clearly that in some of the equations, endogenous variables are a function of endogenous variables. Consumption is a function of disposable income at time t, so that's an endogenous on endogenous. Investment's a function of income, those sorts of things. A reduced form, as I said earlier, has the form endogenous is just a function of exogenous variables. And we'll talk later about why we need that form, but that's the form we can estimate without bias in it. So this is really just 
a matter of solving the equation. This isn't really a kind of metrics as much as just how to solve a system of equations. But let's go back to the first model where we've got the equilibrium condition already subbed in. All right, it's income plus u. U equals beta zero plus beta one p plus beta two r plus b. You do the obvious thing. Alpha zero plus alpha one p plus alpha two y plus u equals beta zero plus beta one p plus beta two r plus b. Then you solve for p equals one over alpha one minus beta one times whatever it comes out. beta zero minus alpha zero minus alpha two y plus beta two r plus b minus u. In a second, I'm going to write this out because we're going to, it'll just be more convenient to have it in this form in a second. That is the reduced form equation for prices. Because prices now are a function only of the data, not other endogenous <coughs> variables. You're basically just solving the model. You're finding the solution to the model. Now we'll call these, I'm going to call them lambdas. Just to make it easier to work with, I'm going to call this P equals lambda 0 plus lambda 1 Y plus lambda 2 R plus, what's that called? E1. Where lambda 0 is that, lambda 1 is that, lambda 2 is that, and E is that. How do I get the Q solution? All we've done is x plus y equals 3, x minus y equals 4. We solved one of these for x. How do you find y? Plug it back into either equation. Right? So to get y, why? P, to get P, we can use either equation. I'll use the, what's the one with the alphas? Is that demand? Yeah, I'll use the demand equation. So Q equals alpha naught plus alpha 1. All you do is sub in the solution here. This is why I use the lambda. I don't have to rewrite the whole thing every time. Lambda 0 plus lambda 1y plus lambda 2r plus E1 plus alpha 2y. So Q 
equal alpha naught plus alpha one lambda zero plus alpha one lambda one plus alpha two times y plus alpha one lambda two r plus u plus alpha one e one. So we're going to call this q equals gamma zero plus gamma one y gamma two r plus e two. So e two is that. E two is that. So the solution is Q equals gamma zero plus gamma one Y two P equals lambda zero plus lambda one Y lambda two R that's E one. Where <coughs> lambda zero is beta zero minus alpha zero over alpha one minus beta one. Lambda one is minus alpha two. Minus beta one. Lambda two is beta two over alpha one minus beta one. And E one is V minus U over alpha one minus beta one. That's just those. I just rewrote them again for you. And gamma zero is going to be um, alpha zero plus alpha one times that, beta zero minus alpha zero over alpha one minus beta one. And that equals alpha one beta zero minus beta 1 alpha 0 over alpha 1 minus beta 1. So if you solve that, that's what you'll get for this term. That's the solution. Gamma 1 is minus alpha 1 alpha 2 alpha 1 minus beta 1 plus alpha 2 and that turns out to be minus beta 1 alpha 2 Beta one. One more. Two more. This one's easy. Alpha one. Beta two. And finally, E two turns out to be U plus alpha one times B minus U over alpha one minus beta one. Alpha one. Here's the problem we're going to face. We want to know things like what's the interest elasticity of demand? If this model's in logs. That's the coefficient on the price term in the demand equation. Or it's some function that. So we, when we estimate the model, this model 
it's just endogenous a function of exogenous. We'll be able to estimate this just fine. We'll regress P on Y and R, Q on Y and R. And we'll get these six estimates. Lambda 0, Lambda 1, Lambda 2, Gamma 0, Gamma 1, Gamma 2. We have to somehow take those six estimates and this set of equations and uncover all the individual pieces. If we can do that, then the model is what we call identified. If we can't do that, we're stuck. We can't estimate this at all. But essentially, we're going to end up estimating these two equations. We'll get six pieces of data. We'll get three lambdas, three gammas, because that's all you get are the numbers on the table that comes out of the, the estimation. And these are the equations that relate the original, um, the original parameters to the things we estimate. Can we then untangle all this somehow to get back to the original equation? That's what we need to be able to do. And in this case, it turns out you can. And we'll talk about how you can figure that out later on. I don't want to get lost in that right yet. This is not completely obvious how you would identify it. So let's just hold off on that. For now, we're just trying to get you to understand the distinction between structural equations and reduced form equations. So this is the reduced form. Now let me do one that's on your next homework, which you've either gotten yesterday or will get tonight. So this is like the one on your homework. Let's go back to the other model. <laughs> yt is ct plus it plus gt. Um, I actually didn't write it down. CT is alpha dot plus alpha one dyt plus alpha two dy t minus one plus ut. It is beta zero plus beta one yt plus beta two yt minus one plus dt. <laughs> Consumption and investment, equilibrium's on top. Here's the definition of disposable income. Income minus taxes. We already have our, our equilibrium condition. So we want to solve this one. I'll just solve it for one of the equations and let you do the rest. Your model's a little bit different on your homework. It's not exactly this one, but it's very close. It's in the ballpark of this. So the endogenous variables in this model are these four here. And we can see this is a function of endogenous. This is a function of endogenous. We've got it all over the place. So we need to fix that somehow. So how do we do that? So how do we solve this model? You just use the equations to sub out all the endogenous variables. So I'll just stick this into there, that into there, this into there, and there. And if you look at this, that's going to give me output as a function of output, and then I can just solve for output. So we'll just sub in for all the endogenous variables here. If there's any endogenous variables in here, we'll sub for them. We don't have to sub for the y's because we can, that's what we're solving for. So in this case, we'll just say, okay, yt is ct, which is alpha 0 plus alpha 1 dyt. I'll do it in steps. We could sub this out right now, but I'll do it in two steps. So there's CT plus IT, B0 plus B1, 
y t plus b two y two minus one plus b two plus g two. This is alpha zero plus alpha one times y t minus t something there plus alpha two y t minus one minus t of t minus one plus u t plus b zero plus b one y t plus b two y t minus one plus b t plus g t. Now I'm all set. variables on the right hand side. I simply use the other equations. I want to isolate yt. If it has a c anywhere on this side, plug in for it. If it has a dy, plug in for it. There's an i, plug in for it. So just eliminate, use the other three equations to eliminate all the endogenous variables except yt, which I'm solving for. So I'm all set to do that. On this side now, there's, everything is either exogenous or yt. So now yt times essentially the numerator of the multiplier, 1 minus alpha, is it beta 1? Yeah, beta 1, is alpha 0 plus beta 0 minus alpha 1 t minus alpha 2 t minus 1 plus alpha 2 plus beta 2 y2 minus 1 plus gt plus vt plus ut. So then yt equals alpha 0 times beta 0 over 1 minus alpha 1 minus beta 1 minus alpha 1 over 1 minus alpha 1 minus beta 1. y t is say lambda 0 plus lambda 1 t of t plus lambda 2 t of t minus 1 plus lambda 3 y of t minus 1 plus lambda 4 g t plus e say y t. So this or this shorthand, that's equal to that. We'll just use some definitions. Because <coughs> now yt is just a function of predetermined or exogenous variables. Uh, I'm not sure how we got from the second line to the third line. Here to here? Yeah, the, the numbers in the third one don't compute in my head. This line here? Yeah. How okay, so the, this side is just that and that move to the other side. Okay. This is just that plus that gives me that. And then alpha 1, T of T is there. Alpha 2, t of t minus 1 is there. The ut goes there. So why did we incorporate like alpha 1 and not alpha 2? Because is this is predetermined. It's exogenous. So that can be on the right-hand side. So I'm trying to solve for the endogenous variables purely as a function of the exogenous. So 
So what I do is I just, okay, this is endogenous, this is endogenous, this is exogenous. Damn, I'm not done yet. Okay, well, I've got an equation. Sub in for the endogenous variables. Okay, okay so far, but oh, I've still got an endogenous variable there. Sub in for it. Now I've got all the C, I, and D, Y's gone at this point. But I've still got my y's on the right hand side. But that's what I'm solving for. So I just move all the y's to this side. So this is just yt minus alpha 1, yt minus alpha 2, beta 1, yt equals that stuff, which is all the exogenous. Taxes are exogenous. Taxes yesterday are exogenous. This is predetermined. This is exogenous. So now we've got it in the right form. And now it's just a matter of just dividing through by this. I took way too many steps. I didn't need to take all these steps, but I wanted to make sure it was all in the notes. And then, then, do, then I just define those to do that. Then to get the other endogenous variables, I'm not going to do it. What you would do is take this equation and say sub it in for here. That's going to give you it as a function, because everything on the right hand is exogenous. Once I sub this out, I'll have it as a function just of exogenous stuff. So I just plug that equation into here. For, for consumption, I just call this yt minus t of t, sub that equation in for this endogenous variable, and solve for consumption, and I'm done. If this had two endogenous variables, say it had c and i on it, I'd solve this one first, sub in for c, sub in for i, and I'd be, so you just sub out the endogenous stuff to get the solution. We're just taking a model where it's you know, x plus y plus z equals 4, x minus 2y plus 3z equals 8, x plus y minus z equals 4. We just take this equation and plug in for z. That's kind of what we're doing here. Take this equation, solve it for x, or solve it for y, plug in there, and solve this for x. So we're just summing everything into the initial equation, so we only have x's. So the x's are the endogenous variables in this model. The, the t minus 1 things are the data. There's this 8, the government spending's 8. Taxes yesterday were 4. Disposable income yesterday was 4. So, so this, these are the data. And so you're just solving for the exogenous, very endogenous things the things determined by the system, x, y, and z, as a function of all the data. So we actually had numbers. This would be some number, you know, whatever, $700 billion or whatever, several trillion, whatever it is. This would be whatever disposable income was yesterday. That's just be data that comes in, and we're going to solve for the endogenous. dy is easy. You can see what the equation for dy is going to be. You just plug this in, and we'll just change this coefficient to the lambda 1 minus 1. not watching movies on your computer, or is this clear? Or I guess for those that are, I'm less concerned about you. Okay. Another example? <coughs> we can write out a money demand equation, a money supply equation, make interest rate endogenous, make M endogenous, and solve the resulting equilibrium. But if you got it, you got it. Okay, then let's talk about why we care at all about all this. So now, 
in my view, the books, I'm going to do the books discussion at this point, but I'm not going to get to it until next time. I found, I didn't find it as clear as I, I would like it to be. So I'm going to try a simplified version of what they do, and then I'll do what they do, and hopefully they're doing the simplified version first will be helpful, because they calculate some things that, well, anyway. Let me just take the simplest system I can think of. So this model doesn't have any exogenous variables, except the errors are kind of exogenous here. But it doesn't have anything exogenous. It's purely endogenous variables. What I have is two-way simultaneity. So what we're looking at is something called simultaneity bias. So we want to look at simul we have simultaneous equations. And simultaneous equations, structural equations, often give us bias. So I want to imagine that you're going to regress y on x. We know what this estimator looks like. It's the sum of the xi minus x bar, y minus y bar, sum of the xi minus x bar squared. But, okay, y has u in it, right? Clearly y has u in it. You see that? x has y in it. So x is, u is an x. If u is an x, those are correlated. That's the problem. That's what we want to show mathematically. x has u in it, so this and this are correlated, so any estimate of alpha here will be biased. I could add, the book's example has exogenous variables added to this, which really complicate the, the, the discussion, but you get the same result. So I just want to imagine running this regression and show that when you have this two-way simultaneity, if, if beta is zero, if I don't have x depending on y, I don't have a problem at all. x is just exogenous, it's random, it's vt, but it's just a random variable. In that case, I don't have simultaneity. I don't have a problem because x no longer has u in it. The reason x has u in it is because y is in there. So when beta is zero, I can run this regression fine. x is exogenous, essentially. It's determined outside the system. The minute I make b non-zero, x is determined simultaneously. It's, part, it's no longer data, it's, it's endogenous. So there it's exogenous. I don't need the system to figure out what it's going to be. Here it's endogenous because it depends on y. It's, it's a simultaneous equation problem. Okay, well we know that if we estimate that alpha hat, that the p-limb of alpha hat is alpha plus the covariance of x and u over the variance of x. We've done that enough times. I'm not going to go through all the steps to get there. We know that, that that's going to be the case. Well, we need to find the reduced form to figure that out. Yikes. So yt is alpha times beta yt plus vt plus ut. So yt in reduced form is 1 over 1 minus alpha beta times alpha vt plus ut. So that's the reduced form. I eliminated the endogenous variable. Similarly, you can show xt is 1 over 1 minus alpha beta times ut plus beta vt. Uh, which one am I on here? yt was alpha vt. This is beta ut, yes, just what we thought. Because it's symmetric, it should be that. There's symmetry here. So those are the, the reduced form equations for y and x. So the variance of x is, remember that the variance of ax is a squared times the variance of x. So I'm going to use that. So this is 1 over 1 minus alpha beta squared times beta squared sigma squared u plus sigma squared v.
That's just the variance of this. These are independent. So this is just beta squared, sigma squared u. This is just sigma squared v. <coughs> and you get the constant squared out in front. So it's just the standard variance formula. And then the covariance of x and y, that's these two things together. When I multiply those together, I'll get 1 over 1 minus alpha beta squared. times, I'm out of time, damn it, alpha sigma squared v plus beta sigma squared u. So, we'll come back to this. We need the covariance of x and u to solve this. I haven't done that yet, so we'll do that next time. So see if you can figure out what the bias is in this, in this problem, and show that if beta is equal to zero, there's no bias.